The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Hi. In our lesson last time, we showed that to find the general solution of a linear differential equation, we first looked for the general solution of the homogeneous or reduced equation, that is the equation where the right-hand side was zero, and then found a particular solution of the original equation, and then the sum of these two solutions would be the general solution. Consequently, we agreed that we would now separate our study into two parts, one to find a general solution of the reduced or homogeneous equation, and the other to find a particular solution of the given equation. In today's lesson, we are going to tackle the problem of finding the general solution of the homogeneous equation, but subject to a very special case, special in the sense that it's easy to handle, but also special in the sense that many practical applications live up to this particular model. What we're going to tackle today is solving the linear equation L of y equals zero, subject to the condition that we have constant coefficients. In other words, we are going to deal with y double prime plus 2ay prime plus by equals zero, where a and b are constants. The only reason I put the two in here is to simplify some algebra later on. After all, if a is an arbitrary constant, so is 2a. We'll talk about that in more detail when, where I need it. The thing is that to solve an equation of this particular type, where a and b are constants, we essentially try for a solution in the form y equals e to the rx, recalling that when we differentiate this, we get r e to the rx. When we differentiate a second time, we get r squared e to the rx. Consequently, substituting this into here, we get that e to the rx is a constant factor, and we're then left with a polynomial in r equal to r squared plus 2ar plus b. In other words, mechanically, notice that the power of r replaces the given derivative. r squared replaces y double prime, r to the first power replaces y prime, and this is the r to the zero term replaces the zero derivative term, namely the zero derivative is y itself. At any rate, since e to the rx cannot be zero, to find the values of r that satisfy this equation, then what we have to do is set this polynomial, in this case a quadratic equation. And notice, of course, if I had order greater than two, the same theory would hold. I have simply, as usual, picked second order equations for illustrative purposes. The exercises will take care of higher orders. At any rate, the values of r are determined by the equation r squared plus 2ar plus b equals zero. Now you see, if I use the quadratic formula and solve this equation for r, I find that r is minus a plus or minus the square root of a squared minus b. That's the reason I used 2a instead of a here. You see, if I had used a here without the two, then the quadratic formula would have said r is equal to minus a plus or minus the square root of a squared minus 4b over 2a. And with blackboard space at a premium, I hate to have to keep writing in a 2a as a denominator. And every time I do that, I lose a line of space on my board. So for convenience sake, I chose the two in here so I could write r this way. Now notice that in general, this determines two values of r, one with the positive square root, one with the negative square root. Let me call r1 the root that I get with the positive sign, r2 the root with the negative sign. And the point that I want to mention is that the nature of the magnitude of a squared minus b determines what the values of r look like. For example, if a squared minus b is positive, then r1 and r2 are unequal real roots. If a2 minus b, if a squared minus b is zero, then r1 and r2 are both equal to negative a. And if a squared minus b is negative, r1 and r2 are complex conjugates. Now the idea is simply this. What we're going to do now is I'm going to summarize for you what these results are. I'm going to use the cookbook technique first of illustrating all three cases for you, giving you examples of each, and then I will conclude today's lesson simply by showing you why the recipes work, and with a little bit of luck, 
for the first time in our course, we may actually have a short lecture. But let's see what actually goes on here. Let's not be too presumptuous. The three cases are this. Either a squared is greater than b, case one, a squared is greater than b, so r1 is unequal to r2, and they're both real. And in this case, the general solution of the homogeneous equation, y double prime plus 2ay prime plus by equals 0, is simply a linear combination of e to the r1x and e to the r2x, namely c1e to the r1x plus c2e to the r2x. For the second case, when a squared equals b, in that case, r1 equals r2. And because they're equal, let me just call both of them r1. Notice that if I came back up here, this would really not be a general solution in this case, because with r1 equal to r2, e to the r1x is a common factor. I could then, con well, amalgamate the two arbitrary constants here and write what? That, that y sub g, the general solution, is just c1 plus c2 times e to the r1x. And if c1 and c2 are arbitrary constants, then their sum is simply a arbitrary constant. It turns out that in this particular case, another solution of this equation, meaning what? Another one other than e to the r1x, which is not a constant multiple of e to the r1x, is x e to the r1x. And we'll verify that later in the lecture. For now, just take this for granted. And in that case, it turns out that the general solution is given by the linear combination of e to the r1x and x e to the r1x, c1 e to the r1x plus c2 x e to the r1x. In the third case, we have that a squared is less than b. That means that r1 and r2 are complex, complex conjugates, which means that r has the form a real number plus or minus i times a real number. Calling the real part alpha and the imaginary part beta, all we're saying is if a squared minus b is negative, alpha is playing the role of negative a here. And beta is just the negative of what's under the radical sign here. In other words, if a squared minus b is negative, b minus a squared is positive. In other words, the beta part is just b, the square root of b minus a squared, you see. And in this case, it turns out that the general solution is a linear combination, a very interesting one. Well, let me factor out the e to the alpha x. What it says is, first take e raised to the alpha x power, where alpha is the real part of our root r. Okay? And then multiply that by a linear combination of sine beta x and cosine beta x, where beta is the imaginary part of r. By the way, without going into this, because the textbook does it very eloquently, and we'll have enough exercises on this to hammer this home later, notice the intrinsically different geometric nature of interpreting these various solutions. For example, in this particular case, just speaking very quickly, here we see that the general solution is the sum of two exponentials. Coming down to here, notice that if alpha happened to be 0, in other words, if r were purely imaginary, notice that the solution would be what we call oscillatory motion. And if alpha is not 0, notice that e to the alpha x c1 cosine beta x plus c2 sine beta x is an oscillation that is either blown up if alpha is positive or shrunk if alpha is negative. In other words, the oscillatory part stays here, but if alpha happens to be negative, say, as x gets very large, e to the alpha x goes to 0. That pulls this whole expression down to 0. And that's the case where you get what's called damped oscillatory motion. In other words, you get oscillation, but the amplitude keeps shrinking. You see, physically, different things start to happen here. And this is a very interesting subtlety, that just small changes change the entire solution or the meaning of the solution. And maybe the best way to illustrate that is to show examples of all three of these cases where the examples almost look alike. Well, let me show you what I mean. For example, we already saw last time that if y double prime minus 4y prime plus 3y equals 0, then the general solution was c1 e to the x plus c2 e to the 3x. That's precisely this case here. Because if we look at the equation that determines r, it's r squared minus 4r plus 3 equals 0. That says that r1 is 1, r2 is 3. The roots are 1 and 3. So two solutions are e to the x, e to the 3x. r1 and r2 are real and unequal. That's exactly the type that we were talking about back here when we were talking about case 1. 
As far as case two is concerned, notice that y double prime minus 4y prime plus 4y equals zero leads to the equation r squared minus 4r plus 4 equals zero. That factors into r minus 2 squared is zero, and that says that r equals 2 is a multiple root. To illustrate case two, again, the proof coming shortly, but not now, what we're saying is that in this case, e to the 2x and x e to the 2x will be non-constant multiples of one another that are solutions, and that consequently, the general solution will be c1 e to the 2x plus c2 x e to the 2x. The third case is that I'll pick is y double prime minus 4y prime plus 5y equals zero, which leads to the equation r squared minus 4r plus 5 equals zero. And solving by the quadratic formula for r, this leads to r equals 4 plus or minus the square root of 16 minus 20 over 2. The square root of 16 minus 20, that's the square root of minus 4, is 2i. 4 plus or minus 2i over 2 just leads to 2 plus or minus i. Since alpha is the real part of the root, alpha will be 2. Since beta is the magnitude of the imaginary part of the root, beta will be 1. In this case, alpha is 2, beta is 1, and therefore the general solution is what? e to the 2x times c1 cosine x plus c2 sine x. And by the way, before I leave this example, here's what I meant by saying how subtle this was. Notice that all three of these equations are identical except for the coefficient of y. In the first equation, the coefficient was of y was 3. In the second equation, 4. And in the third equation, 5. Other than that, they all looked alike, the equations. And yet, in one case, we got the two real and unequal roots. In the second case, we got the real but equal roots. And in the third case, the non-real complex conjugates. All right? That's all there is to this lesson, except for giving you some insight as to why these recipes hold. From this point on, the rest is drill, that there's not much more we can do other than to have you uh, look to see what's happening and work on the exercises. But I thought that it might help if I give you a few little supplementary notes as to why these things work out. And they work out easily enough, so I decided to do the supplementary notes as part of the lecture. Namely, first of all, notice that in the case where r1 is unequal to r2, and they're both real, that e to the r1x and e to the r2x are both real solutions. And more importantly, since one cannot be a constant multiple of the other, their linear combination must be the general solution. That's what we saw last time. Remember, the only time you were in trouble is if one was a constant multiple of the other. Why can't e to the r1x and e to the r2x be constant multiples of one another? The answer, quite simply, is this. Assume that they were. Divide both sides by e to the r2x. We then get e to the r1 minus r2x as a constant. But look at this is e raised to a variable power. The only way that e raised to a variable power can be a constant is if the multiplier of the x is itself 0, so that the x doesn't appear here. In other words, in that case, notice that r1 minus r2 must be 0, and that's the same as saying that r1 equals r2. In other words, the only way that e to the r1x can be a constant multiple of e to the r2x is if r1 equals r2, but we're given in case 1 that r1 is not equal to r2. That's why the solution works. As far as case 2 is concerned, notice that what we have to establish is it's obvious that x e to the r1x is not a constant multiple of e to the r1x. After all, their ratio is x, which is not a constant. The hard thing to do is to justify how we can find out that x e to the r1x is a solution in that case. And the answer is, look at that, that case occurs when a squared equals b. If a squared equals b, notice that y double prime plus 2ay prime plus by becomes replaced by y double prime plus 2ay prime plus a squared y. Now we very cleverly invoke the trick of writing 2ay prime as ay prime plus ay prime. See, we take this and write it like this. Now we factor out an a from this expression here. We have a times y prime plus ay. Notice that these two terms are just the derivative of y prime plus ay. In other words, if I let u equal y prime plus ay, then this being u, means that with the prime on this, this is u prime, this just becomes u prime plus au equals 0. 
That's a first order differential equation in U in which the variables are separable. So in other words, this becomes this. From this, I can very quickly find that U is equal to C e to the minus AX. I didn't want C, I, wanted, I didn't want U, I wanted Y. I remember that by definition of my substitution, U is Y prime plus AY. Consequently, this leads to Y prime plus AY is C e to the minus AX. This is a first order linear differential equation. We learned how to solve that in a previous unit. Leaving the details again to you, it now follows that a particular solution of this equation will be y sub p is x e to the minus a x, recalling that in this case r1 is minus a, this is x e to the r1 x. This together with e to the r1 x form your two linearly independent solutions, and consequently that's why the general solution in this case is c1 e to the r1 x plus c2 x e to the r1 x. The third case where we got the imaginary roots, or the non-real roots, hinges on a very interesting property of linearity plus complex functions. If u and v are real, notice that L of u plus i v by linearity is L of u plus i L of v, because after all, i is a constant, be it imaginary or otherwise. Consequently, by linearity, since L of u plus i v is L of u plus i L of v, the only way that L of u plus i v can equal zero is if L of u plus I L of v equals zero, and the only way a complex number can equal zero is if both its real and imaginary parts are zero. In other words, then, if L of u plus I v is zero, it means that L of u and L of v must themselves be zero. See, the real part must be zero, the imaginary part must be zero. Now, how do we apply this to case three? Notice that in case three, we solved for r and got that r was equal to alpha plus or minus i beta. Let me pick the positive root. And we said our solution was e to the alpha plus i beta x. Now the idea is this looks quite imaginary, and it is in this form. But what we've just seen is that since this is a solution of this homogeneous equation, the real and the imaginary part separately must be solutions. Consequently, if I write this in the, in the traditional u plus i v form, then u and v separately will also be solutions. Well, let's see how I write e to the alpha plus i beta x in traditional form. First of all, this is e to the alpha x times e to the i beta x by the rules of exponents. We recall from our lecture on complex functions that e to the i beta x is cosine beta x plus i sine beta x. Consequently, e to the alpha plus i beta x is just e to the alpha x times this expression here, or separating it into the form u plus i v, e to the alpha plus i beta x is e to the alpha x cosine beta x, which is a real number because alpha and beta are real, plus i times e to the alpha x sine beta x, and e to the alpha x sine beta x is also a real number because alpha and beta are real. In other words, u the alpha x cosine beta x, that's the real part of this complex number. V is e to the alpha x sine beta x, which is the imaginary part of this. Since we've just seen that the real and the imaginary parts of this function must satisfy this equation also, that tells us that e to the alpha x cosine beta x and e to the alpha x sine beta x also satisfy this equation. And that, by the way, is exactly what we saw in case three, only we factored out the e to the alpha x. Notice, by the way, that these two equations cannot be constant multiples of one another, because if we divide, say, the top by the bottom, the e to the alpha x cancel. Sine beta x over cosine beta x is 10 beta x. And for beta not equal to 0, 10 beta x can't be a constant, so that these two solutions do indeed generate the general solution. Now, that's all there is to this particular problem. The rest, as I say, is left to the exercises. What we're going to do next time is tackle the companion part of this problem, and that is, how do you find the particular solution of a linear differential equation with constant coefficients where the right-hand side is not zero? In other words, the non-homogeneous case, but more about that next time. So until next time, goodbye. Funding for the publication of this video was provided by the Gabriella and Paul Rosenbaum Foundation. Help OCW continue to provide free and open access to MIT courses.
by making a donation at ocw.mit.edu slash donate.